Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you all for coming out to our first uh, first ever Winnipeg meditation flash mob at the Forks. Yeah. We've come together today to engage in something um, that might seem a, a little bit radical. I think a lot of the uh, the Buddhists and Buddhist meditators and meditators in the Winnipeg area when they heard about this were a little bit hesitant to get involved thinking that it might be something radical and even um, outside of, or inappropriate. Okay. But um, surprisingly enough, meditation flash mobs are going on around the world. They're being conducted in, apparently, over 250 cities around the world. And they've got a website where they're coordinating all these efforts, so in fact, in Winnipeg, we're kind of behind the game. So this is us catching up and showing our support for this movement, actually. It has become a movement. Of course, flash mobs are something familiar to most people who don't live in uh, Buddhist monasteries or forests or in caves or so on. So most of you are aware what a flash mob is. Um, but the idea of a meditation flash mob might seem a little bit odd and actually I think has got some people a little bit hesitant about this, so we'll have to use this as an example of how, how much good can come from it. I think we've all agreed that even just this first attempt at a flash mob has been quite successful. But the question is successful how? The question is why, why a meditation flash mob? And so I'd like to talk a little bit about why we're doing what, what we're doing. The first reason, and uh, the real reason for deciding to do a meditation flash mob was for, of course, the effect that it would have on the people who witnessed it. The idea behind uh, a flash mob is to inspire, to provide a performance in a sense, something that allows people to see something out of the ordinary and to be inspired, um, to be encouraged and to provide joy and uh, happiness to the people who see it. Specifically, of course, what we're trying to do here is encourage people in the practice of meditation. This morning we went into a store in uh, here in Winnipeg and we, were, we, we got there and it looked like the store was closed and then this guy came to the door just as we were getting to it and unlocked the door and let us in and while we were conducting our business this woman came up and asked to talk to the manager, asked to them what the manager's name was and the guy said, oh he's not here, can I help you? and she just tore into him saying you were, a, you were away for an hour and he said, well, I was away for half an hour and they got in this argument and he said I'm allowed to take a lunch break, and she says, I want to talk to your manager, well, you're not, you're, it's not appropriate for you. It was a huge deal for this woman that this guy had been away for even an hour, and, and to which he denied and said he'd been gone for a half an hour. And I thought, well, that's just a perfect example of what we're trying to uh, address here. That on a Saturday morning, uh, people should be so stressed that uh, they can't wait in a parking lot for a, a store uh, clerk to take his lunch break. So we're trying to, if you think about the audience, the people around us, of course, they all seem fairly normal, besides the guys with the punk haircuts and so on, but um, everyone looks like they're living ordinary lives. And of course, if we think a little bit deeper than that, we all know that that's not the case. If you look at statistics, uh, pretty much everyone has their, their 
story to tell. And of course, everyone in this group, we all have our stories to tell. Things that we're keeping inside and that we have to deal with on a regular basis, our difficulties. But at, le at the very least, all of us have this practice of meditation. Now, these people that we're addressing, they don't have this. And so providing them just this vision, this uh, uh, image, this idea that there might be a aspect of life that they're missing, a part of life that they, they could uh, use that would, would benefit them, you know, that they're not that they're missing from their lives. This image is, is 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 I think a very important, very useful thing to provide. This is what we're doing, and this is I think why it feels so exciting when we finish this. And for those of you who were peeking, uh, and I wasn't peeking, so I don't. I'll have to look at the video afterwards and see. But uh, for those of you who saw, everyone was excited and encouraged. I think especially by younger children, of course, because they're far more open than adults who might be even uh, concerned about this or, or upset about this, thinking that it's some kind of cult activity or so on. But especially for the children, providing them with this image As the Buddha said, samananan One of the highest blessings of life is to see people who are uh, of quiet minds or of peaceful minds. Uh, and so, if you think back to when you were, most of us were children, unless we grew up in a Buddhist society. For most of us, this would, you know, I would have, I would have been ecstatic to see people meditating when I was young. I grew up in a small town in northern Ontario, where the idea of meditation was something, uh, of course completely foreign to the culture and the society. So to have this and to have the children ask their mom, their parents, what are they doing, mom? <laughs> and uh, when they hear their mothers explaining to their children to be quiet and they're meditating and so on, this opens up a whole new universe to these people. So the inspiration that we give, this is what a flash mob is supposed to do. And I think uh, what could be more inspirational than people sitting there doing nothing. <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite inspiring because you know the Buddhist or the meditator the meditators motto don't just do something sit there. This is our we are the opposite of, of what people do and people can't as Blaise Pascal said all of our pro all of our problems come from not being able to sit alone in a room for any length of time. All of our problems come from our need to be active, our need to consume, our need to uh, see and to do and so on. You see this in Thailand uh, or in Asia, in, the, in these Buddhist countries. My teacher said, he said, look at these foreign people who come here and they just look, 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 look. They'll never have an end. They just keep looking and looking for something and they're never going to find it. And it's true. When we go to, even when people come here to the forks, they're coming here to see something. So the question is, what are they going to see? And we provide them with something new. This is the first reason. The second reason, <clears throat> the second purpose to what we're doing is to inspire ourselves and to come together. One thing I realized as we were doing this is this is a actually a group activity. I've met new people today, which I didn't really think of as going to be a part of this. I've, I've you know, met all of you and we've become closer and talking and, and, and just being together as a group. We've brought together, I think, at least three, four Buddhist communities in, in Winnipeg, just with our small group here, and with the idea that uh, probably if we do this again and again, uh, it, it will only increase. So it's a chance for us to come out of our shells. I was saying this is kind of a, a coming out experience for all of us for all of us closet meditators. It's a chance for us to show our, our meditator pride and, uh, and show that we are meditating, well, not pride, but I'm making a play on the whole uh, gay pride, no. So we're gay in a different way. <laughs> our happiness comes from, not from sexuality, but it comes from, uh, from renunciation comes from letting go, comes from, from within.
So we're expressing this and we are bringing meditation into our society. This is something that I've always felt very important, that it's one thing to bring happiness to yourself, to try to, to cultivate your own uh, happiness and peace and, and goodness inside, but no one is an island, right? We, we, you, you can't expect to find this peace and happiness without also impacting the world around you. And this is what you sometimes find in Buddhist societies that were quite insular. And even here in the West, I've talked to Buddhist, Western Buddhist societies where they would never want to encourage other people to practice meditation, and they feel like it's somehow just something they do, they've decided to do, not something that uh, they think is, could embedder the world. It's just like a club that they've joined. And so they don't ever think to, um, not to proselytize or to be missionaries or so on, but to uh, give the opportunity to others or to present this to other people, which is so. This is what we're doing. We're not uh, out handing out flyers. We're um, presenting some opportunity for people. And if they ask about it, well, we have flyers that we can give out and we have books on how to practice meditation and we invite people to join us. But the point is that we're impacting our society for our own benefit. We're trying to make our society a peaceful, uh, harmonious society that we can practice meditation in, where people don't scream and yell at us because we're half an hour late or, or so on. This is something that tends to disrupt your meditation. Number two. Number three, the final reason I think that I can think of why we're doing this is to inspire uh, or to, as I said, to show our support for the meditation mob movement. And so this will be going up on the internet and we'll have, uh, we'll, we'll in hopefully inspire other people to perform such uh, activities along with all the other groups that are doing this and we'll try to coordinate with them and there's going to be one where in September where the whole world will be doing this all on one day uh, all the meditation mobs around the world will synchronize and do a world meditation mob. So that's why we're doing this. Now I just wanted to talk a little bit about what we're doing. This is something you know, most of you have your own meditation practice, but just for those people who are watching and, and for the, the general audience and to remind us of basically what we're doing here. Or, uh, what we do in the in the Buddhist tradition, to in in regards to the practice of meditation, what does it mean to practice meditation? In in um, and I'm going to go by the tradition I follow, but I'll try to be fairly general and just give some basic outlines as to what we mean by meditation, because the word meditation, of course, means different things to different people. Uh, Rene Descartes had this idea of the word meditation, and and in the West, pre-Buddhism pre or pre-Hinduism, uh, uh, before meditation became, meditation of this sort became popular in the West, it, it referred more to contemplation, so thinking about mulling over some topic. Uh, and so the, the word meditation, of course, is very broad. For most people, even today, who do practice meditation, it simply means uh, an escape from reality. But uh, meditation in the Buddha's teaching, as I understand it, is not for an escape and certainly not to contemplate or to think about anything. Meditation in the, in the Buddhist sense is to create understanding, uh, to create specifically wisdom and understanding. And the theory that, the, that lies behind all of the Buddha's teaching is that understanding or wisdom is enough to uh, lead to complete freedom from suffering, is enough to solve all your problems. That all of our problems, all of the difficulties, all of our suffering can be overcome with by one quality of mind alone, and that is wisdom. So our meditation practice is for the purpose of seeing clearly and simply creating understanding. This is what we're trying to do. The idea is that a person who has understanding, who has wisdom, will thereby um, be uh, 
be in tune with all other good qualities, so love and compassion and, and joy and kindness, all, all of these qualities of, of mind that we all aspire to will come from understanding and, and they falter due to our, our misunderstandings. Um, so any problem that we have, any difficulty that we come, with in our, come to in our life, the idea is that it's simply our misunderstanding that is causing us, causing it, uh, f making it cause us, bring us suffering. If we come to understand it, we will be free from suffering. So the, the thrust of the Buddhist teaching is to create understanding about our experience and, and about, in general, every situation that we come to, to be able to understand it in terms of its ultimate reality. The general types of misunderstanding that the Buddha the Buddha talked about, or the, that, that are at the core of the Buddhist practice, are the misunderstandings of permanence, the misunderstanding of satisfaction, and the misunderstanding of controllability or self. So permanence, happiness or satisfaction, and self. And the idea that we have, the, the idea behind these misunder that makes the misunderstandings is that um, nothing in the world, nothing outside of ourselves is permanent. Nothing un, un, out of, outside of our, nothing in our experience is, can provide the stability that we need to be truly happy. That there's nothing in the world that we can rely upon uh, to make us happy. It's impermanent, there, everything is impermanent, is unstable, uh, is uns, therefore unsatisfying and a cause for suffering and is uncontrollable and not uh, amenable to our, our will, our, our mastery and can't be truly called a possession. So uh, the idea being that we focus on the objects of our experience or, or we, we misunderstand the objects of our experience as being, con as being uh, stable. We think of the people that are in our lives or we think of the situations in our lives. We think of even the experiences that we have as being somehow stable, as somehow lasting. We think that when we get what we want, it's the happiness that comes is going to somehow provide some lasting uh, stability for us. We think of the things that we strive and, and and so we cling to them. We cling to the objects of the sense, we cling to people, we cling to places, we cling to things, we cling to the positions in our lives. And we have expectations about them. We expect for them to provide us with this stability. Uh, we misunderstand that the objects of experience are, are satisfying. So we think that sensual pleasure is somehow going to satisfy us because we think of it as stable, uh, lasting. We, uh, we think that uh, acquiring possessions and status and uh, position all of these things uh, are going to somehow satisfy us, and we, so we strive for them. We think that we can find happiness in our experiences and in our acquisitions. And so we strive and, and, and we create this uh, ambition and, and uh, desire for sensuality, for, for positions and, and for ideas and concepts and, and Maybe being rich, being famous, uh, having a secure and stable position in life, and so on. And we we uh, misunderstand things as being permanent, uh, as being self, as being controllable, and so we try to force things. We try to force our lives. We try to force our minds. We try to force the people around us to conform to our idea of. Uh, of, of what is right, of what is proper, of what is good, of what is somehow going to bring us happiness, somehow is going to provide stability. So the Buddhist teaching is for the purpose of destroying these and helping us to see impermanence, uh, uh, impermanent suffering and non-self, to see that these things are not capable of bringing us this 
stability, of, not, of bringing us this satisfaction or of, of, and are not amenable to our control. Point being to try to find happiness within ourselves and to let go of our expectations and to be comfortable with the world or with experience no matter what uh, might come our way, no matter what presents itself to be able to roll with the punches and to be, to be able to dance with life instead of fight with it. And the way that we do this is to try to focus on ultimate reality, to try to focus on the experience itself and to try to get out of these head games, the mind games of creating uh, ideas and expectations and, and, and concepts like uh, duties or, or responsibilities in terms, I mean, in terms of unrealistic expectations and to uh, live dynamically or flexibly so to be able to when someone's 30 minutes late to be able to deal with it I was saying this woman wouldn't survive, this woman who came in this morning wouldn't have survived a day in, in many of the countries that I've been to because they have a different work ethic and uh, not necessarily uh, in, in fact, in some ways, a much better work ethic because there's far less stress and, and suffering when there are far less expectations. And our need for things to be in a certain way or our uh, expectation or clinging to things being a certain way is, is, of course, a cause for great suffering. It creates conflict when other people have other sorts of expectations. So we're trying to create this sort of flexibility by focusing on what's real, in, on the way things are, instead of the way we'd like them to be. And so, to do this, we practice what the Buddha called mindfulness. And I think mindfulness is certainly the most common Buddhist meditation practice, so uh, most people are quite familiar with the concept. I'm just going to go briefly, briefly through what it means and uh, discuss the, a basic technique of practicing mindfulness. So when we talk about mindfulness, we're referring to a ability to recognize reality as it is. So when you experience a phenomena, whether it be seeing or hearing or smelling or tasting or feeling or thinking, when you have an experience, to experience it just as it is without all, sort, without all the ordinary baggage or judgments without liking it or disliking it or wanting more of it or wanting it to go away or wishing it hadn't come uh, or being afraid that it might of, of what might come in the future to simply accept it for what it is to be here and now when you experience pains to experience them just as pain when you experience happiness to experience it just as happiness when you experience liking or disliking to experience it just as it is and not let it become something more. Uh, a lot of our problems, even the negative qualities of mind, are only negative because we um, we extrapolate upon them, or we, we we cause them to snowball. So we're afraid of our fear, we're worried about our worry, we become anxious about our anxiety, we're depressed about our depression, we're angry about our anger. We 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 perpetuate all of our negative emotions by not being able to experience them just as they are. And so this is what we're trying to do. Experience reality objectively, reminding ourselves. The word mindfulness, sati, means to remind yourself. Uh, the, the original word is simply this ability to remind oneself so that we don't forget ourselves. We don't forget what's really going on. When you experience pain, for example, to not forget that it's just pain, to not get lost and caught up in the worries and the fears about what it might become and how it might, uh, what it might be and, and the aversion towards it and how to get rid of it and so on. To simply see it as pain and let it go and to be able to continue on and be flexible, to be able to experience pain, to be able to experience happiness, or to experience the whole spectrum of reality without uh, requiring it to be something else. And the, the method that we use in the tradition that I follow is to literally remind yourself so when you feel pain, you would remind yourself pain. When you would feel happiness, you would remind yourself happy. When you hear something, you would remind yourself hearing. When you see something, you would remind yourself hearing. Just in your mind, create this clear thought, the objective reminder. It's just that. 
it is what it is. It's nothing more, it's nothing less. And to do this, we break our experience up into four parts. We have what are called the four foundations of mindfulness, the body, the feelings, the mind, and the dhammas. Dhammas being a sort of a miscellaneous group, miscellaneous category. But we start with the body, and so we'll focus on the bodily experiences. When, when you're sitting, we just remind ourselves sitting, just knowing that we're sitting. If we're watching the breath, we'd watch the, uh, the effect that the breath has on the body. When the stomach or the chest rises, we would say to ourselves, rising. When it falls, we would say to ourselves, falling. Just being aware as it happens. We're, we're already aware of it, just reminding ourselves, keeping ourselves with that bare awareness so that it doesn't become something more. It's not, <clears throat> there's no identification or, or attraction or aversion. It's just the experience. For the feelings, when we feel happy or when we feel pain, as I said, when we feel pain, we'll say to ourselves, pain, pain, just meditating on the pain, really. Not letting it give rise to disliking and aversion, because actually the pain isn't the problem, it's the aversion that's the real problem. When we feel happy, likewise, there's nothing wrong with happiness, of course, but once you get into liking and wanting, it creates desire and addiction and this habitual need for specific types of experience, which can never be fully satisfied. So to stay at just being happy, of course, we experience the happiness just as we experience the pain. And we say to ourselves, happy, happy, just staying with it. When we feel calm, likewise, we say to ourselves, calm, calm. And for the mind, when we're thinking about the past or the future, whether it be good thoughts or bad thoughts, again, we're not even trying to stop ourselves from thinking. We're not trying to control we're trying to understand. And you can't understand something if you don't let it happen. You can't even understand your negative qualities of mind if you're always running away from them or pretending they don't exist or feeling guilty about them. Everything we have to experience, we have to let it arise. We have to let it come. So when you're thinking, don't try to quash the thought, but just remind yourself that's thinking so that you don't get caught up in whatever the content of the thought is and get lost in ideas and concepts which don't really exist anywhere except in your mind. What really exists at that moment is a thinking. There's an experience of thinking. So we remind ourselves thinking, thinking, just meditating on it. And with the dhammas, well, there's many different kinds of dhammas that will come across. The first one is the hindrances. These are the most important to talk about right off the bat because they're what will attack us and keep us from ever seeing clearly and from ever finding peace, happiness, or freedom from suffering. They're what uh, hold us back in our lives and in our, our, our goals, in, in, both in, in the world and spiritually. So they're very important to address right away and throughout our meditation practice. But again, we're not judging them. Even though I've said now that they're bad things, I want you to practice as though they were just objects. Uh, maybe paying a little more attention to them because they will be uh, the thorn in your side throughout your practice, if you don't. But again, trying to be as objective about them as you can, not letting them snowball into some big problem, because that's where the problem arises, not from these emotions themselves, but from when we let them get to us. When you like, like something, dislike something, when you feel tired or drowsy, when you feel distracted or worried, and when you have doubt or confusion, these are the states of mind that are going to cause us problems. So when we like something or when we want something, we'll simply try to stay with it and not let it become something more, not, not react to it. Like we say to ourselves, liking, liking, or wanting, wanting. When we dislike something, we we'll say, disliking, disliking. Or when we feel angry or sad or dis depressed or bored or frustrated, afraid, we we'll just say to ourselves, uh, just like angry, angry, or bored, bored, or so on, according to the experience. When we feel tired, we'll say tired, tired, just reminding ourselves. And, and in some way, removing the imbalance that is causing these, uh, these things to arise, they can only come when you're off balance. If your mind is pure and clear in the present moment, none of these things will arise. So there's something wrong. And just by bringing your mind back to the present moment, back to an awareness of it, it will disappear. When you say to yourself, tired, tired, so, uh, miraculously you'll find that the fatigue will dissipate because it's an imbalance in the mind. Either that or you'll fall asleep. 
Uh, the fourth one is distraction and worry. So if you're worried or distracted as well, say distracted, distracted or worried. And if you have doubt or confusion, say doubting, doubting or confused, confused. And the only other Dhamma group that's worth con thinking about, at least for, on a basic level, is the senses. So right away when you see or hear or smell or taste or feel or think something, you can be mindful of that as well, saying to yourself, seeing, seeing, or hearing, hearing, smelling, smelling, tasting, feeling, as I said, already thinking, being aware of the experience. This is basically how one might go about trying to understand reality. And of course, there are other techniques that are similar to these or even perhaps somewhat different. But all in all, we're talking about a objective awareness, the, the reminder or the ability to remember things as they are. This is what we mean by the practice of meditation. So this is, um, well, just something to uh, provide some, uh, some instruction on this day of, of mindfulness and we'll try to um, maybe do, uh, con coordinate this, conduct this sort of this experience on a weekly basis and uh, you know, we, we have we have the space here so in the future we could have discussion, we can have uh, different sort of uh, activities going on maybe we can do the, med do the talk first and have the meditation afterwards sometimes Today was our first test run, so I think this was a great success. Uh, everyone's already uh, talked about, uh, listened to people talking about how they, they think people reacted positively to it. So it's great to see, great to hear, and thank you all for coming out. Now, as a last um, sort of a closing activity, I'd like to ask everyone to uh, close our eyes and send our thoughts of goodwill and kindness and compassion to you know, first the spirits and the people that uh, are here in, at the Forks and then to uh, our families and loved ones and our enemies and to the whole world. Just spend about five minutes now sending good thoughts to the world. <laughs> 